Hey, hey everybody, and welcome to another edition of Fun with Flags. I'm your friendly neighborhood soda, joined as always by my my good friend on the other side of the globe, Fifty Shades of Geek. How's it going? Spooky Fifty. Mm-hmm. I've been I've been doing about as well as I can. I'm try, trying to keep my my mind off everything else that's happening in the area, you know, and in my in my 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 attempt to try to sway my thoughts as far away from the general conversation happening as possible, my sneaky, devious mind thought of something. Uh-oh. And I'm not going to share with you. I did, We did not talk about this off screen in the green room. We didn't... I, I did not clear, First time I've heard. Yeah, I did not clear this up with, with the good friend Soda. So... And, and I do admit, I acknowledge it is perhaps a terrible idea but it's also perhaps a genius idea which okay. can only come from me the, this type of this type of balance okay so listening are you ready for this and again i'm not saying it's a good idea i'm just saying it, it's something to think about okay okay what if the mcu's magneto is a survivor of the October 7 events instead of being a Holocaust survivor. The October 7 events. Got to refresh my memory, unfortunately. What's happening now? What's happening right now in my area? Okay, do explain. So instead of being a survivor of the Holocaust, Magneto? Oh! What if was, oh. What is it? Instead of surviving the Nazis, he survived Hamas. So you would make him Middle East? That way you can still keep the Jewish connection without having him be 90 years old. Oh, that is fucking genius. 50, get a hold of Marvel. Yeah, like they listen to me. You never fucking know, man. Stranger things have happened in the world of comics. Seriously. I know. And again, it's... I realize it's too it's too recent. Too soon, but still. Over 200 people are still being held hostage. I can't even call them hostages. Kidnapped. Dude, in, fight me. With fight Hamas, me. But, but like, seriously, by the time they'll get around to, to doing X-Men movies, hopefully the, this whole dark chapter of our, of our history will be long forgotten. Not forgotten, but just long behind us. Yeah, the wound's healing. I get a hold of Kevin Feige if you can, my dude. <laughs> you know, I'll call him. I got his number on a speed dial. It's called Twitter. It means you have to actually go on to the thing. I still don't know how Twitter works. It's not that hard, 50. If you can do All Facebook, right, you can do Twitter. All right, fine. I'll and again, I refuse to call it X. Yes. <clears throat> so now we got that part out of the way. <laughs> it's, nice, it's nice that I get to see your reaction to it live. And we've got... Recorded video evidence of it. Yeah. Oh, that's actually really good. Really good. Yeah. Literally thought about this today at work while trying to distract myself from thinking of the kidnap, which in a way I did. My mind did go back to the kidnap, but not in the way. Yeah. You, was. you, you use the horrors of what's going on and actually made something creative out of it. Yep. That's me. Oh, Oh, I'm actually just going to do this for my sakes, because now it actually looks like I'm talking directly at you from my point of view. All right. Uh, so we are here. And funny enough, like I said to 50 just before we started, I never actually took any account uh, that we're in October for this. For this uh, Spooktober. For, for, yeah, exactly. Spooktober for this topic, because this is very much a, a Halloween topic. Um, it is the, um, well, it is Goosebumps. Which, for whatever reason, I thought for many years was Canadian. I thought I was mistaken. Uh, it was a Canadian TV show. But no, the books are actually American. Uh, this was actually a really big phenomenon when I was a kid. Um, hold, hold, on, hold on. Say that again. So the books are American originally, but this new TV adaptation. Yeah, basically. So, yeah. So um, I'm not really, I'm not really going to get into it at all. So might as well bring it up now. So the books came out, they were a big hit. Then they made, there's an original TV show that they made in the nineties. That's actually the one I was referring to. That's Canadian. Then they did the two movies and the new show is actually, yes, it is filmed in Canada, I believe. 
if not Washington State, which is on the other side of the border from from. from but, yeah, it's still very close. It's still very close. From what I'm from looking at the landscape, it looks like it might have been filmed on Vancouver Island. I could be mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but yeah. show, so how, what do I know? We will we will be getting actually a little bit into that TV show. We'll give you my thoughts on it at the end. Um, but yeah, so as usual, I've got my notes, which I've taken bastardized from Wikipedia because I'm lazy. <clears throat> and uh, if I'm honest, uh, I'm not getting graded on this, so I'm not actually going to write something. I can actually do this. The hell with you, English teachers of high school. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, what do you know? <clears throat> well, yeah. uh, all right. So the Goosebumps series falls under many genres, but mainly horror and thriller. Although the author, R.L. Stein characterizes the series as scary books that are also funny. Each book features different child characters and settings. The primary protagonists are middle class, so like you and me and what have you, and can be either male or female. In Goosebumps stories, the central characters are often placed in remote or isolated locations diverging from common societal conventions. This can range anywhere from comfortable suburban areas to boarding schools, foreign villages, or campsites. Books typically feature characters which either recently moved to a new neighborhood or are sent to stay with relatives. The books in the Goosebumps series feature similar plot structures with children being involved in scary situations. At his peak, R.L. Stein was known to complete these stories extremely quickly, some of which were written in only six days, and as based on the size of the books, which yeah. you know, they're, only, they're only like a hundred and some pages. I could probably, depending on how fast I went, I could do it under two hours easily. I could probably, yeah, if I read really fast. Yeah, that, that, that would most likely be the length of the audiobook. Yeah, and actually, funnily enough, uh, uh, I've got actually a story about an audiobook. That, that I try to do this afternoon when we get when we get go on later. Okay, so put a pin on that. <laughs> um, uh, but, 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 but. The books are mostly written in first person narrative, often concluding with twist endings. They contain surreal horror with characters encountering the strange and supernatural. According to the documentary Tales from the Crypt, from comic books to t- television, which I I just realized I have to watch. Um, R.L. Stein said that he remembered reading the popular slash infamous Tales from the Crypt comic book series when he was young and credited one of his as, as credited as one of his inspirations. Now, have you ever heard of Tales from the Crypt 50? I have mostly through John Schnipp's uh, Hero, totally the Collider Heroes thing. Okay, well, uh, for those who don't know, Tales from the Crypt was a very old anthology. Uh, well, the TV show was an anthology TV show that was hosted by a character called the Crypt Keeper, which is it's hilarious, but as when you see it as a child, scary as shit. And those were originally based off a series of comics. <clears throat> it's amazing what one can remember. Thank you, John Schnepp. Um, books and characters in the series were inspired by books and films. For example, the character of stupid mouse, uh, the character of Slappy the Dummy was inspired by the literary classic The Adventures of Pinocchio. Really? Some, yeah, I did not know that myself. Um, some of the characters, uh, b- 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 some of Stein's ideas for the books also come from real life. Uh, Stein got the idea for the book The Haunted Mask after his son Matt had a Halloween mask. He got trouble getting off. Ooh. Stein also uses his childhood fears to help him write his books. The author said, luckily, I have a great memory. As I read a story, I can remember what it feels like to be afraid and panicky. Stein states he often thinks of a title to a novel first, then lets the title lead him to a story. Two common themes. Sorry? Smart way to do it. Very much so, especially when you're doing children's novels. Don't want to overthink it. Two common themes in the series are children triumphing over evil and children facing horrid or frightening situations and using their own wit and imagination to escape them. Stein does not attempt to incorporate moral lessons into his novels and says his books are strictly reading motivation. Now, when I was a child, I actually had the entire set. How many books are in the set? 62. The original series is 62. I had them all, but I gave them all to my cousin except for one, which I still have. And I I I will show it when we get to the book. 
And it actually plays into the audiobook story as well. So, <laughs> all right. So now what I did is is I um I got a, a picture of every book, the original with because they re-released them and they released them in sets and stuff like that. I I got pictures of the original covers as best as I could. Some of them was hard to find something that was not a web file. Um. And so I'm just going to give like a brief quick summary uh, with each book just to keep it nice, quick and easy. And then at the end, I'm going to quickly talk about, like I said, the new TV show, which I've been watching because I enjoy and uh, give my thoughts. All right. So the first book in the series we have is a book called Welcome to Dead House. Amanda and Josh Benson move with their parents, Mr. and Mrs. Benson, into a crazy old house in the strange town of Dark Falls and meet new friends who are like any kids they have known before. Uh, the second book in the series was a book called Stay Out of the Basement. Dr. Brewer is doing a little plant testing in his basement. Harmless, he says, but his daughter and son Margaret and Casey Brewer were worried about their father, especially when they see some of the plants he is growing down there. Mm. Then things get real strange when they notice their father developing plant-like tendencies. So he's Swamp Thing. He's yeah, basically he's turning into like a Swamp Thing, kind of like a la Swamp Thing by way of the lizard. Like like he you know he did the same processes, but he ended up being a uh, Swamp Thing. Um, and I'll, just a little bit, the Canadian TV show that I mentioned earlier, the old one, they, it was literally just adaptations of these books. Cool. And if I'm not mistaken, there are actually some people who went on to be mega famous who did episodes, I think. So, All right. Very frequent for 90s Canadian TV. <laughs> All right. Third up, we have the book Monster Blood. Ooh. While standing with his weird grand aunt, Catherine, Everton Ross visits a funky old toy store and buys a dusty can of monster blood. It is fun to play with at first until Evan notices something weird about the green slimy stuff. It seems to be growing and growing. <clears throat> the fourth book uh, was a book called Say Cheese and Die. <laughs> uh, Greg my favorite title so far. <laughs> nice. Some of these are actually really, really clever. I will give them that. Um, Greg Banks thinks there is something wrong with the old camera he and his friends found. The photographs keep turning out wrong. Very wrong. And we will expand a little bit on that. Basically, the pictures predict, show how you're going to die. Oh. Yeah. Um, the fifth book, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. Gabe Hassad is spending Christmas vacation in Egypt with his Uncle Ben and cousin Sari. He is invited to explore a tomb by his Uncle Ben, an excursion on which he gets lost and encounters some of his ancient residents in the form of mummies. And let me guess, something bad happens to Uncle Ben. Uh, probably. I don't remember. <laughs> Actually, it's been a while. Uh, make the name. Uh, yeah, well, probably does. I mean, usually something happens to at least one character. I don't think I don't think he got the joke, folks. No, I got the joke. I got the joke. I got the joke. I mean, it's it's on the nose. <laughs> All right. Um, now the sixth book is called "Let's Get Invisible." Max and his brother Lefty find a mirror in the attic that can turn its users invisible. But the more Max, Lefty, and their friends use it the harder it becomes to return. Ooh. Now, the next book is probably the most famous book because this is the one that introduces Slappy. Hmm. Night of the Living Dummy. <laughs> Lindy Powell finds a ventriloquist dummy in the trash named Slappy and keeps it, prompting her bratty twin sister, Chris, to get one named Mr. Wood as well. However... When destructive pranks begin happening, the sisters begin to wonder if their dummies have anything to do with it. Why is this bow tie on backwards or upside down? Is that like part of the disheveledness? Never noticed. Maybe, but you know what? It must be, I'm, I'm assuming it might have something to do because of the hint of the jaw. Oh. Uh, Just yeah, because of the contour that's in it? 
Yeah. Uh, sorry, not the contour, but the, I mean the 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 the, fucking... the curvature. Yeah, that. Sorry, I was thinking contour because of me and Lou, Lou the other day in the chat. <laughs> All right. All oh, right. yeah, I remember that. Yeah. It's like, why the fuck didn't you just say that? <laughs> it slowly struggles with words in English sometimes. What are you going to do? Yeah, and I, I forget. I live with that. It's just like having to do with my parents. Uh, the French Canadian. All right. The eighth book, The Girl Who Cried Monster. Excuse me. Lucy Dark likes tormenting her younger brother into thinking that monsters are real. Till she learns that her librarian, Mr. Mortman, is one. Gee, that's a creepy looking guy, you know, on the on the cover. Oh yeah, there there's a few of them you're gonna be you're gonna get that feeling for sure. Uh next up is Welcome to Camp Nightmare. Billy Harlan is staying at Camp Night Moon. Uh is staying at Camp Night Moon. Sorry, the wow, they really wrote this wrong on the thing. Billy her Billy Harlan's stay at Camp Night Moon turns to horror when word of the monster Saber lurking in the woods crops up, followed by a series of events leaving campers injured and missing. Next up, we have the ghost next door. Hannah Fairchild is startled to wake up from a horrific nightmare of her house burning to find that the empty house next door has suddenly been sold as if overnight. And the son of the family somehow has the ability to survive a series of near-fatal accidents. After she investigates, Hannah discovers to her shock that Danny Anderson might be a ghost. A mysterious shadow follows her throughout the story. That hand holding the book is creepier than the book the cover. Yeah, that's one of the so you might there's a few of them where you might see some hands just because, like I said earlier, I had to like get the best picture I could of the original cover. Yeah, I noticed that, but I mean, look at the guy's hand. It's look, it looks like the guy that survived the, the burning house is holding the book about the burning house. Maybe. Speaking of which, I had a, uh, I, speaking of hands, I had a saw customer not that, that long before my shift was over where he had this hand covering. It looked like Tim, uh, Danny DeVito's penguin. Because it looked like, he looked like he might have been missing fingers, but the way it was, yeah, it was a big thumb. And then, like, just two fingers. I was like, holy shit. I didn't say anything, but in my head, I'm like, oh, I, I want to know what happened there. Dude, I literally I literally once drove, not drove, but rode on a, a, t a taxi where the driver literally has only two fingers in his right hand. The pinky and the thumb. And he was literally holding the, the steering wheel with just his thumb and his pinky. Was this and he was driving that way. Was, he, was his name Lucky? Uh, I didn't ask the name, but I doubt it. <laughs> All right. Number 11, The Haunted Mask. Sick of being the butt of everyone's practical jokes and appalled that her mother made her a lame duck costume for Halloween, Carly Beth Caldwell decides to buy a mask from a strange costume shop. But the more Carly Beth wears it, the more her personality changes and the harder it is to take the mask off. Smoke it! Oh, no? No? Mm. Wrong franchise. <laughs> yeah, sorry, my bad. Uh, not Canadian, though. Is it? Is it? Is it is that Canadian? No, 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 no. Jim Carrey is Canadian. but Well, yeah, Jim Carrey is, but yeah. I, th I thought the mass comic books were also that. Um, Not that I'm aware of, if I'm being honest. All right. Number 12. Be careful what you wish for. And if I'm not mistaken, this one had a famous person in it. I might look that up later. Mm -hmm. um, a klutzy and unnaturally tall 12-year-old girl named Samantha Flyaway Bird, as nicknamed by the bully Judith, is given three wishes by an elderly woman named Clarissa, which gives Samantha what she wants at the price of everyone else around her. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. You know, I just thought of a what could be a great Doctor Who title. Mm hmm be wishful what you care for. Whoa. Interesting. Now the, the, now, I can guarantee someone at Big Finish is gonna make is gonna turn that into a great story. Maybe. Actually, it's, 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 maybe. Because they do they do stuff like that. I haven't thought of that yet. Not everybody's me. 
<laughs> that is very much true. Like Nick, Nick, uh, speaking of what uh, R.L. Stein uh, said, that that's a philosophy that Nicholas Briggs do, does a lot. Like every once in a while, he just thinks of a what could be a cool title for a Doctor Who story, and he just writes it down in a notebook and and like keeps it for later. And then every once in a while, he goes over the, some of the names he wrote down, and he's like, "I want to make a story about this title. What what's it going to be about? No idea. I'll just give the title to someone to, to, to one of my." Uh, big Finnish writers, and he'll make a good title out of it, good story out of it. It's not bad. But yeah, be wishful what you care for. I mean, you should probably <laughs> email him on the podcast or whatever. Me? Go ahead, give it a shot. Like I said, you never fucking know. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Book 13. Piano Lessons Can Be Murder. Da-da-da-dum. Yeah, I knew, I knew that was going to come up. <laughs> Uh, those movies were great. Those original movies. <clears throat> All right. Jerry Hawkins and his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins, have just moved into a new house where Jerry finds an old piano in the attic. Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins decide to put the piano to good use by making Jerry take lessons. But Jerry discovers the disturbing truth about the piano and the insane piano teacher who just loves Jerry's hands. Creepy. Little bit. Some of them, some of these are, are definitely creepy for sure. That's the intent. Exactly. And they did their job. <laughs> like I said, I was I, I was at the right age when these came out. Uh well. Okay. No, I didn't get him when the first book came out in 1992, so I would have been five. So that's definitely not a thing. Not the right age. But I, I was definitely when I was in the right age group when I got the book, anyways. Uh, all right, 14. The Werewolf of Fever Swamp. Grady Tucker and his sister Emily Tucker have moved into moved to a rural area in Florida near a swamp notorious for werewolf sightings. When a strange dog becomes Grady's new pet, the entire town suspects the dog of being a werewolf that is terrorizing the swamp. The f- the 15th book, You Can't Scare Me. Now, no, no joke, I don't remember much about this one outside of the cover. Uh, two pranksters team up to scare a fearless girl named Courtney in the town of Muddy Creek. Well, naturally. When all of their pranks backfire, they decide to use the local swamp, said to be cursed, the cursed burial ground for the town's original settlers who died in a mudslide and were reborn as mud monsters. Yeah. Number 16, One Day at Horrorland. Out on a day trip, the Morris family got lost on their way to Zoo Gardens and end up in a theme park called Horrorland, which is run by monsters called Horrors. How very creative. Right? Again, children's novel. Yeah, don't think about it too hard. Yeah. Why I'm Afraid of Bees. I'm afraid of this kid. <laughs> the klutzy wimp Gary Lutz, a.k.a. Lutz the Klutz, <laughs> finds, <laughs> finds an online advertisement, advertisement, which however, however, which way you prefer, for a, clinic that, for a clinic that specializes in body swapping. However, the experiment goes awry when, instead of the body of a cool jock named Dirk, Gary finds himself in the body of the one thing he fears the most, a bee. Now, this was clearly based off the movie The Fly. <laughs> of course. All right. Well, next. I guess I, I guess all you have to, to do is just let it be. Ooh, wow. Very topical. All right. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Uh, A lot of your, interest. Yeah, your mouse is not the only one that there we go carry on all right now we have our first sequel monster blood 2 evan and his friend andy once again contend with the evil novelty slime called monster blood this time 
and he is revealed to have still have some of it left and accidentally feeds it to the class hamster cuddles. Okay, no joke. And this sort of ties into a conversation we had off screen in the green room. I can I can tell this inspired another episode of the Powerpuff Girls. Really? Yeah. Wow. Who knew? You can tell where these people get their inspirations from. No kidding. No fucking kidding, eh? All right, 19, Deep Trouble. I think I might have seen this cover once upon a time in a bookshop or something. Maybe. maybe. These did get released all over the world. When I was looking at Yeah, I mean, the, but the, the covers. Cover with the same covers. The covers are what sticks with you. The yeah. covers are what sticks with you. On vacation on the Caribbean island of Elandra, Billy Deep is rescued from the jaws of a great hammerhead shark by a mermaid who is targeted by Billy's uncle, Dr. George Deep, for scientific experiments about rare sea life. Mm -hmm. Number 20, the Scarecrow Walks at Midnight. And yes, these are being done in chronological order, of course. When visiting their grandparents' home on the farm, Jody and her brother Mark discover that the farm is haunted by demonic scarecrows brought to life by a farmhand's black magic. And if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, the book ends with everybody actually getting turned into fucking scarecrows in that family. Yeah. And if, uh, yeah, I, do, I think I've seen it too. And I, I think I remember that episode of the TV show. Very fucking creepy. All right. 21, go eat worms. Todd Barstow loves collecting and experimenting on earthworms. Things get sticky and slimy when the worms begin appearing in Todd's lunch and his homework, and Todd soon comes face to face with a giant worm wanting to get revenge on him for mistreating her babies. Number 22, and another one that I I remember the cover more than I remember the book, Ghost Beach. The Sadler siblings tried to resolve the mystery of a ghostly resident living in a mountain cave near the beach. Not much. Number 23, Return of the Mummy. A year after his previous encounter with the mummies, Gabe flies back to Egypt to attend the grand public opening of the pyramid his uncle Ben was excavating from last year. Gabe and his cousin Sari soon find themselves trapped in a pyramid and the news reporter they trusted named Nyla soon reveals that she is not who she seems as she wants to awaken the mummy of Prince Kauru. That's another uh, cover that seems familiar. I think I might have seen This it. is definitely one that, from that early series, they definitely use in a lot of promotional items. Hmm. Yeah, there's there's a few. There's, there's a couple. Next up. Phantom of the Auditorium. So not Phantom of the Opera, because that's two on the nose. It is two on the nose. Brooke Rogers and Zeke Matthews were chosen to play Esmeralda and the Phantom in the school version of the Phantom of the Opera. But a chain of accidents impede production and threatened to have Zeke kicked off the cast. Now, this is the only book I kept. Ooh. Because of the whole Phantom of the Opera at all, um, yeah. For some reason, this was the yeah. This is not for some reason. It's because of that. This is the one I read the most. So when I gave my books to my cousin, I told her this is the only one I'm keeping. You get your own, <laughs> which she ended up doing. Um, and yeah, I, I did for, because because I haven't read it in a long time. But I do remember. I do the ending did stick with me. Um, I did try to listen to find an audio book. Couldn't find one, but I, so I went on YouTube and it was like, oh, hey, there's an audio book. Cool. Two hours. I got three hours left of my work shift. Let's fucking go. I turned it on. I turned it off within about 30 seconds. It was literally, it felt like somebody put it into uh, an automated dial token, uh, uh, automated system. Like it was a fucking robot that was reading it. There was no personality. It was, it was like, no. <laughs> you need that in, a, in an audio book. Exactly. That got annoying real fast. Um, but so I'm just going to discuss this, this book just a little bit. So uh, what happens is uh, something happens. Zeke ends up losing the part. And there is this character named uh, uh, Brian, I believe his name is. 
that shows up and um, and takes over the role. Now, what's interesting about this play is uh, it had not been performed in a really long time because the last time they performed it, something happened to the lead actor. The guy playing the Phantom, he died because of an accident. This is the this is the TV show or the book? Book. And then oh. they first adapted it for the original TV show. So yeah. So it's like there's there, there is definitely some some similarities going on between what happened in the past when the first it was canceled the first time and the remounting of the play. Uh, yeah. Now, if you don't mind, because it is not that long, it's would take me less like three, four minutes. I'm going to read you the final chapter. Uh, now, remember what I said. There was an accident that happened in the past. Something happened now. Zeke loses the role. This guy named Brian steps in. Okay. I squinted into the thick blue fog, desperate to see his face. The bright spotlight flashed in my eyes, blinding me for a moment. In that moment, the phantom covered his face with both hands. I reached to pull his hands away. No, he screamed. No, you can't. He staggered back away from me, staggering and lost his balance. No, no, he cried. You can't, you can't, and toppled backwards into the open trap door and vanished in the swirling blue fog. I heard his scream all the way down, then silence, a horrible still silence. Remember, this is like the Phantom of the Opera where it's all happening on on stage on stage in the performance and so basically there was a phantom that was actually causing these accidents in the, the in the lead to the place so yes it is the phantom of the opera yeah it is the phantom of the opera at the phantom of the opera this was my exposure to the phantom of the opera not gonna lie can, can i can i have a quick tangent so you remember p posh when we did an episode about that video game yes 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 so all throughout the game he keeps mentioning weird obscure roles he's played on stage yeah every once in a while and and at one point he mentions that he that once he he appeared in the phantom at the opera phantom oh, wow. at the opera get it he was a phantom fighter plane and he crashed into the opera house in tel aviv it was a sitcom that's pretty good <laughs> all right the audience rose to his feet and burst into loud applause and cries of bravo. They all thought it was part of the play, but I knew better. I knew that the Phantom had finally revealed himself after 72 years, that he had finally had his moment on the stage, and that he had died all over again. Poor guy. As the curtain closed, muffling the excited cheers of the audience, I stood at the opening of the floor, my hands pressed to my face. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. I stared down into the hole on the floor and saw only blackness. Then, raising my eyes, I saw Zeke running across the stage to me. Wearing jeans and a white t-shirt, he lurched towards me, his expression dazed. Zeke, I cried. Ow, someone hit me, I think, he moaned, rubbing the back of his head. I've been out cold. He raised his eyes to mine. Brooke, are you okay? Did the Phantom, I cried. He took your part, Zeke. He's, he's down there. I pointed in the opening. We've got to find him. I stepped on the peg. The trapdoor clanked and groaned. The platform returned to the top. Zeke and I climbed aboard. We rode it down, down to the chamber below. We searched every corner. We couldn't find him. We didn't find the mask or the costume or anything. Somehow I knew we wouldn't. Somehow I knew we would never see him again. Great job, people. Great job, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Walker, the drama teacher, called to us as we trooped on stage, off stage. Phantom, I liked the new lines you added. Great job. See you all at the cast party. Zeke and I struggled to get to the dressing room so we could get changed. But we were mobbed by people who wanted to congratulate us and tell us how talented and terrific we were. The play was a major success. I searched for Brian. I could, I wanted to tell him all about the Phantom, but I couldn't see him in the excited crowd of friends and parents. Come on, let's get out of here, Zeke cried. He pulled me by the hand out of the auditorium and into the hall. Wow, we're hit, I exclaimed, feeling totally wrecked and pumped and dazed and crazed all at the same time. Let's just get our coats and get changed at home, Zeke suggested. We can try to figure out who played my part on the way. Then we can meet at my house to go to the party. Okay, I agreed, but we have to hurry. My parents are waiting to tell me what a fabulous star I am. The sound of excited chattering and laughter drifted from the auditorium and followed us as we made our way to our lockers. Hey, I stopped in front of my locker. Look, Zeke, the 
door is open. I didn't leave it unlocked. Weird, Zeke murmured. I pulled the door all the way open and a book toppled out onto the floor. I bent to pick it up. It was an old book. It's brown cover, worn and dusty. I turned it around, squinting to read the cover in the dim light, dim hall light. It's a really old yearbook, I told Zeke. Look, it's from this school, Woodmills, but it's from the 1920s. Huh, how'd it get in your locker, Zeke asked, staring down at it. My eyes fell on a torn sheet of paper tucked inside, a bookmark. <clears throat> Gripping the heavy old book in both hands, I opened to the pages marked by the bookmark. Wow, Zeke cried. I, I don't believe it. We were staring at a yearbook article about the play we had just performed. The Phantom to be performed in the spring, read the headline at the top. This must have been written early that school year, I said. We know the play was never performed. We know the whole story of what happened back then. Hold the book up to the light, Zeke instructed. Let's check out the pictures. I raised the book, and we both stared down at the small photographs that covered the two pages. Then we saw it. A small blurred black and white photo of the boy who had won the starring role. The boy who was to play the Phantom. The boy who had disappeared. The boy was Brian. I, that always stuck with me for whatever reason. And that's why I've never gotten rid of the book. No. All right. Take a drink of water and onward. So what do you think so far? Uh, like we like we said earlier, think of the title first and then make up the rest of the, the, rest of the story as, as you go along. And clearly, the, the, guy, the guy's got some lore. Oh, yeah. Whether it's lore he's creating himself or inspired by other stuff. But the guy knows his stuff. The guy knows how to construct 100%. horror stories. Have you seen – did you ever see the two movies that came out not, long, not that long ago? Okay. I was, I was never a Goosebumps guy. I never read the books. Just I saw the television show back in the day and never watched it. Just out of curiosity, because the reason I ask is because Jack Black's character in those movies, he's playing a fictionalized version of the author of the books. Hmm. Yeah, so, so I was asking if you'd seen it or not. All right. I said, yeah, I, knew, I know Jack Black was in, in the movie, yeah. That first one was surprisingly really good. I don't think I've seen the second. But anywho, onwards. All right, book number 25. And just so you know, that's the last book I'm going to do that with. Only book I was doing it with. So. All right. Uh, this is the only book I remember. All right. The only book you have physically. That too. So number 25, Attack of the Mutant. Comic book addict Bradley Skipper Matthews finds out his famous comic book villain, the Masked Mutant, is real. But a visit through the lair has Skipper losing his grip on reality after seeing comic book panels with himself as the hero. Number 26, My Hairiest Adventure. Larry Boyd freaks out when his hands become hairy, presumably as a result of exposed tanning lotion. Things get weirder when his friends begin to disappear, and dogs who share their physical features appear in their place. That did not go where I thought it was going to go. A Night in Terror, in Terror Tower. Eddie and his sister Sue were vacationing in London, England, when they became lost in a medieval torture chamber called Terror Tower and have to run from the Lord High Executioner. Things get weirder when they begin losing their money and their memories. The Cuckoo Clock of Doom. <laughs> to get back at his bratty sister Tara for ruining his birthday party, Michael vandalizes his father's new cuckoo clock by twisting the bird's head backwards so Tara will get blamed for it. His plan backfires when he finds himself reliving his disastrous birthday party and goes back in time every time he goes to sleep. And the twist is it creates a bunch of doubles of them. Make copies. All right. Next up, Monster Blood Three. Oh, again? Yes. In this That's third, very popular. In this third installment of the Monster Blood books, Evan Ross accidentally ingests some of the evil screen slime after his nerdy cousin Kermit. Yes, Kermit. Uses Kermit. It in a chemistry experiment and grows into a giant. Well, it ain't easy being green. Yeah, whether you're whether you're uh, whether you're jolly or not. I and what's ironic is look at the book; it's green. <clears throat> yeah. 
good timing after I poked myself in the eye. Ow. Ow. Why did you do that for? Because <laughs> I went to put my head in my hands. <laughs> okay. Anywho. Um, next up is book 30. It came from beneath the sink. Katrina and her brother David find a loving sponge. Or it's not a loving, a living sponge underneath the sink. A loving sponge. That would be a whole different book. Okay. Uh, Katrina and her brother Daniel find a living sponge underneath the sink in their new house that turns out to be a monster called a gruel that causes bad luck for anyone who finds it. Looks like a crocodile. I can't remember what the what it actually ended up being. Uh, next up. Night of the Living Dummy 2. Amy Kramer gets a replacement ventriloquist dummy named Slappy, which he accidentally brings to life by reading a spell from his coat pocket. The Barking Ghost. Cooper Holmes and his new friend Fergie are stalked by two ghost dogs who haunt the woods and produce a bone-chilling bark. Yeah, pun. Now, oh, Jesus. Hey, look at the look at Look at the little subtitle. So I didn't even hear what you said because I was talking. Really bad dog. Yeah. It, this one's pretty much it looks like it's based off Cujo, the Stephen King novel. Yeah. Except now, it's, well, what dog is it? it a- not sure. It looks cuddly. It's nothing like my dog. Not, not like Cujo. No. Nope. Cujo's a St. Bernard. All right. Now, if you thought that other guy was weird looking, get a load of this guy. Yeesh! The horror at Camp Jelly Jam. While on a road trip with their parents, Wendy and her brother Elliot get inside their parents' trailer and crash into a sports camp named King Jelly Jam's Sport Camp. Sports Camp. The two decide to stay and participate in the activities until their parents can come for them. But while Elliot is enjoying the competitive spirit, Wendy finds it all too bizarre, especially when the winners end up missing. One of the counselors survives a bone-crushing hit to his chest. Everyone is disappointed in Wendy, who is not sharing their obsessive competitive spirit, and the ground begins to shake at night. This is another one I remember the ending very well. Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes. (laughs) Joe Burton's father, Mr. Burton, buys two garden gnomes named Hap and Chip. But Joe and his sister Mindy discover that the garden gnomes were alive and caused destruction at night. If I do remember correctly, at the end, somebody becomes a garden gnome. Ooh. A shocker on Shock Street. Erin Wright and her friend Marty were big fans of a series of horror movies made under the Shock Street banner and are picked by Erin's father, Mr. Wright, as the first kids to tour his new Shock Street theme park ride. But while the two were on the ride, all the animatronic creatures like the giant praying mantis, wolf boy, wolf girl, and other creatures start to get out of control and try to kill them. The Haunted Mask 2. Steve Boswell goes to the mask shop that Carly Beth went to in the first book and buys an old man mask to scare little kids he is forced to coach in school as punishment for a prank from before. And much like Carly Beth in the first book, Steve finds out that the mask he bought is bent on warping the personality of anyone who wears it for too long. The headless ghost. See the hand? Nah, couldn't get that. Couldn't get that from the cover. Nope. The pranksters Dwayne and Stephanie love to visit Hill House, a place said to be haunted by a ghost boy who was decapitated by an evil sea captain. One night, they decide to go on go to the house after it closes to find the boy's head, but accident actually end up encountering the headless ghost as well as a few other restless spirits. This is another. Now the next one is another one where the, the this was promotional everywhere. I actually had a, 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 a mini poster that someone in my family bought me of this cover, hmm. the Abominable Snowman of Pasadena. Jordan and Nicole Blake were sick of living in Pasadena, California, especially during the winter months where kids in other states get to enjoy snow. The two get gets their wish when their father, Mr. Blake, is assigned to travel to Alaska to find the abominable snowman. 
But trouble ensues when the abominable snowman and his snow, which, when thrown, can turn anything into ice, is brought back to California. And you can see there that there's an ad for the TV show. So this, but by this point, the TV, the TV show was show airing. Was yes, this uh, came out in January of 1996. So yes, definitely the TV show was out. Hmm. Whoa! How I got my shrunken head, and this I had to use a YouTube thumbnail to get the freaking picture. Um, Mark, a chubby 12-year-old boy who prefers the company of video games to actual people, is given a shrunken head by his jungle explorer and Benna, Benna's assistant. The assistant suggests that Mark be brought down to the jungle island of Belladora to visit his aunt Benna, but soon discovers that the assistant, Dr. Richard Harlins, Carolyn Hollins, and their daughter, Kareen, uh, are plotting to shake Mark down for information on the jungle magic the shrunken head possesses. Night of the Living Dummy 3. He's got a family now. Trina O'Dell's father, Mr. O'Dell, used to be a famous ventriloquist, but now he only collects and refurnishes old ventriloquist dolls in his spare time. He finds Slappy in the trash and adds them to his collection. After reading the words that come with Slappy, not only does the evil dummy come to life, but so does his entire collection. So this scared the shit out of a young Matt. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Bad hair day. Hair day. Ah, now I get it. It's funny. It's funny. It's All right. a punny bunny. Oh. He ain't no Easter bunny. He's a punny bunny. Hey. Amateur magician. Hey, 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 Tim. Again. <laughs> Amateur magician Tim seeks out to a midnight magic show held by his idol, Amazo. After Amazo puts Tim in a box, he drops backstage and stumbles upon Amazo's dressing room. Tim steals Amazo's magic bag and finds that Amazo's magic is more than he can handle. Now, this one, I really don't remember much outside of the cover as well. Egg Monsters from Mars. What? During a disastrous Easter egg hunt in the backyard, Dana Johnson finds a strange blue-veined egg and keeps it. When it hatches, Dana discovers a pile of scrambled eggs with eyes known as an egg monster. Dana shows it to a scientist, but the scientist ends up imprisoning, Im imprisoning Dana with his discovery. Okay, so Dana is a boy. Okay. The Beast from the East. Beast. Ginger Wald, a former nature camp survivor, and her twin brothers, Nat and Pat, end up lost in the woods where beavers slash bear like monsters calling themselves beasts challenge them to a dangerous game of tag called Beast from the East. Say cheese and die again. Again. To prove to his, and by the way, we're in the last third of this. We're almost at All the right. To prove to where this is number 44. To prove to his English teacher, Mr. Sauer, that the camera he found in the summer is real, so he can raise his sorry. Mr. Sauer. Yeah, that's actually a real last name. My aunt Carrie, that's her maiden name, Sauer. That's a real nice last name. That's a real last name, it's German. Oh, well, I did not know that. Sorry. My my bad. Oh no, no, it is it is pretty funny because there are some funny jokes out there. One of the nicknames she told me that she was given in high school she didn't like was Sour Power. Mm. All right. To prove to his English teacher, Mr. Sauer, that the camera he found in the summer is real so he can raise his failing grade on a class assignment, Greg goes back to the abandoned house to retrieve the camera and finds that it still works. But after accidental snapshots, he finds as... Oh, whoever wrote this is horrible. He finds that... He finds a sherry... I guess a friend or something becomes skinnier and skinnier. Greg grows fatter and fatter. Hmm. Like that Smallville episode. Well, kind of. Kind of. Ghost camp. <laughs> Following the leader. The leader. <laughs> Harry Altman and his brother Alex Altman go to Camp Spirit Moon, where the campers turn out to be ghosts who want to use Harry and Alex's bodies to escape. Now, this one, I, 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 
Oh, sorry, it's the next one. I don't remember. Never mind. How to kill a monster. While at their grandparents' house in a swamp in Georgia, Gretchen and her stepbrother Clark decide to put her, their differences aside when they find themselves trapped in the house with a swamp monster. That's another one I think I've seen the the cover. Yeah, this was another one for promotional. So yeah, you probably did. Now I really don't remember this one. What? I know I had it. Like I, like I remember vaguely the cover, but I remember f jack shit about it. Marissa and Justin, the kids of the famous writer and storyteller Richard Clark, decide to help their father find an ancient parchment called the Lost Legend, and soon find themselves in the woods of Rovania, home to silver-coated dogs, thousands of mice, and Vikings thought to have been dead long ago. So, Legend of the Lost Legend. Yeah, I know, right? Kind of, kind of feels like he's starting to run out of steam. With the titles <laughs> now. Um. Yeah, maybe. All right. Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns. To get payback on two bad kids who always ruin her Halloween, Drew and her friend Walker recruit the help of twins Shane and Shauna, but instead of the twins, two pumpkin-headed monsters appear and force all four of them to trick or treat all night so they can be fanned up for eating. Vampire Breath. During an air hockey game, Freddy and his best friend Kara accidentally knock over a china cabinet and find a secret room housing a coffin and a bottle labeled Vampire Breath, which brings to life a vampire called Count Nightwing in search of his fanged dentures. Yeah. Calling all creeps. After getting kicked out of the school newspaper club, Ricky pulls a prank on newspaper head Tasha by putting a message for all creeps to call Tasha after midnight in the next issue of the school paper. However, Tasha shows that she is wise to his trick and puts Ricky's name in the message instead of leading instead leading to Ricky being stalked by lizard like creatures posing as the school bullies who need Ricky to plant metamorphosis seeds to enslave all of humanity. That went dark really fast. Yes, it did. Beware the snowman. After her mother died, Jacqueline and her uh, and and her aunt uh, Greta moved from Chicago to an Arctic Circle town called Sherpia, where everyone lives in fear of an evil monster disguised as a snowman living in the mountains. When Jacqueline goes searching for it, she finds that the snowman knows about her missing father and her dead mother's secret hobbies. The name's Man Snowman. <laughs> All right, the final 10, or maybe 11. 10 or 11. How I Learned to Fly. To one-up his rival Wilson and win the heart of his crush, Mia, Jack Johnson finds a book that teaches people to fly, but soon finds out that Wilson has also learned to fly, and after stunning everyone with a race, the two become reluctant celebrities. Chicken, chicken. What? The farm girl Crystal and her brother Cole find themselves out of luck when a mysterious woman in black named Vanessa shrieks chicken, chicken, after the two accidentally knock her down in front of the grocery store while walking home, and the siblings begin growing feathers and beaks. Don't go to sleep. But I very much like you. <laughs> Very soon, 50. Despite his, despite his mother's admonitions, Matt spends the night in the empty guest room of his house and ends up waking up in a new world and on the run from a police force bent on stopping those who warp reality. <laughs> the blob who ate, that ate everyone. See what I mean? It's starting to run out of steam. <laughs> The aspiring writer Jack is given a typewriter and pen by a woman whose shop was destroyed in the lightning storm. The typewriter is just what Zack needs to finish his story about the monstrous blob, but Zack and his best friend Alex soon discover that life has a horrifying way of imitating art. <laughs> the Curse of Camp Cold Blood. Uh, this sorry, is Camp probably the scariest you've seen so far. Oh, 100%. The Curse of Camp Cold Lake. There we go. Sarah Mass hates Camp Cold Lake because of the apathetic campers and the myriad safety rules, so she pretends to drown herself to win friends. 
Fortunately, the plan backfires when Sarah has a near-death experience and meets a ghost girl named Della, who will stop at nothing to make Sarah her friend in the afterlife, even if it means killing her. Yep. Uh, 57. This is the only one that doesn't actually have the title on it because the only one I could find where the best representation of the original book is a co collection. Hmm. Uh, so number 57, my best friend is invisible. After visiting an abandoned house said to be haunted, Sammy Jacobs soon gets a new friend, a boy named Brent, whom no one, not even Sammy, can see. Deep Trouble 2. Billy and his sister, Sheena Deep, were back on summer vacation with their uncle, Dr. George Deep, in the Caribbean. When the two go swimming, they discover an evil plot to breed mutant sea life and end world hunger. Weird goal, mismatched goals there. All right, the final four. The Haunted School. During a dance at his new school, Tommy Frazier and his new best friend, Ben, go into go into an elevator in search of banner paper and find themselves in a black and white world where most of the school's missing class of 1947 now resides. Thanks to, uh, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. Bless you all the way. There we go. All right. Wow. Bless you all the way. I, oh, that's going to be an interesting song, song title. All right. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Find themselves in a black and white world where most of the school's missing class of 1947 now resides thanks to an evil photographer named Mr. Chameleon's magic camera, while the rest of them have descended into madness and started a cult bent on ridding the world of color. As you can see, the, tie, the, the picture has nothing to do with the premise. Clearly, yeah. All right. Werewolf skin. Aspiring photographer Alex goes in search of werewolves in his aunt and uncle's small town and discovers that these werewolves are closer to him than they think. Spoilers, it's his aunt and uncle. Yeah, I couldn't guess that already. All right. I live in your basement. Feed me, Seymour. Pretty much. I sick of his overprotective mother keeping him from having fun. Marco sneaks off to play baseball and gets hit in the head. While recuperating at home, Marco begins getting strange calls from someone called Keith who wants someone to take care of him. And the more Keith is around Marco, the more Marco's reality becomes warped. Mm. And the final book. Number 62 in the series. You are not going to believe the title. Lay it on me. Monster Blood 4. <laughs> no, really? Yeah, it ends with Monster Blood 4, the original run. Evan, Andy, Kermit, and Conan once again battle the monster slime, but they soon discover that this Monster Blood is an excessively thirsty, purplish, blue, slug-like creature that can multiply by feeding on water. Da -da -da. It looks like the 60s cyber mats. With lips. Yeah, well, they they kind of had lips too, but they were like hairbrushes. It's it's a weird sight. And to wrap it up, the reason why I thought of this topic is because, like I said, there is currently a TV series that is now playing on Disney Plus uh, in my in my neck of the woods, uh, based on the on the novels. And what is interesting, so there is a main plot uh, with a ghost that is haunting uh, haunting the kids. Um, that every every episode is a title of the book, and they actually took the premise of the book and managed to weave it into the story. That is so well done. I'm so very it's like uh, it's like an, a shared universe type thing. Kinda. So there so is the book is like a, a an evil Nick Fury type thing. So what they did is they've actually or have aired the episode where they tell the origins of of uh, the origins of of how we got to where we are. Um, basically, uh, all the haunted items were in this one house. Uh, the kid, the kid who was living there, um, Slappy ended up taking possession of him, um, like driving him nuts. The house gets burned down. 
And then so years later, these kids are in the house because nobody's lived in there in years and they each take individual items. And those are the items that like the camera. So we have Say She's and Die as an episode. Haunted Mask was an episode. So that one, the person turned into a troll because she was an online troll. Mm. Um, Go Eat Worms was another one. The worms made the kid invincible and he, he wanted to be like his dad, who is an extreme stunt person and do this really big jump that his dad never survived. Turns out his dad was suicidal and did it on purpose. Huh. Um, oh, what else was there? Uh, Cuckoo Clock of Doom was another one. And of course, Night of the Living Dummy as well. Um, but yeah, the way... Because like, you, you gotta have Slappy in there. 100% because Slappy is basically like the ringleader of all this. He's like the conduit between the, 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 evil, the evil that possesses all these items. He's kind of... He, He's kind of like a what's the best way to do this? He's Thanos. No, he's he, he he's Thanos and Thanos sent an emissary on his behalf. How's that? Say that again. He'd be if Thanos had sent an emissary on his behalf, like sent someone as his as so his so, th so there's someone else above Slappy then. Exactly. All right, now it makes a bit more sense. Yeah, so I highly recommend it. It's on. It, it comes out every new episode comes out on uh, Fridays. Justin Long is in it, so that's always a plus. Um, a, a couple of the main actors are, are familiar people. Um, yeah, definitely go check it out. I cannot wait for the next episode. All right, so fifty. That is it for me. Thank God, I can have another drink of water. What is your topic for next week? So. Again, in light of things that, that have been happening recently uh, in in this region, I feel like it's it's always important to uh, to, to, st to stand by uh, your, your country when certain things happen to it. So in honor of that, I am going to do something that's the most pa patriotic thing one can think of Whichever country you're talking about, we're going to discuss the national anthem Ooh. of Israel, also known as the Tikva, the national anthem. So we're going to break down verse by verse uh, the uh, what it says. Well, I'm going to translate it for you, and uh, we're going to uh, I'm going to explain what each line of the verse of the verses mean. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, that's All my right. topic in this week. Sounds good. All right. So, myself, you can find me over at soda underscore on soda underscore the underscore saxman on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find me uh, also, you know, here doing my normal stuff. And uh, just realize that it's actually been a while since so you've done an episode, but you can actually find me over on the Soga Dagan Wrestling Network as well. And you, 50. You can find me over on my channel, 50 Shades of Geek, where just earlier today, I crossed the 500 subscribers mark milestone. So congratulations, Demi! And uh, if you if you go over there and be add to those 500 subs, I do weekly reviews of every single Doctor Who episode from 1963, although the 2022. And I talk even more Doctor Who on this channel on the greatest show in the galaxy when I'm not doing fun with flags with this guy every week. And you can also find me on. I'm uh, sorry. You can also check out all of these wonderful channels from the wider Benvers. Like Something to Talk About, Galaxy Geeks, Multiverse of Geekdom, Movie Lovers Unite, Mid The Midnight Cinema, Time Reviews, and of course, of course, the wonderful In the Front Row, which is still not pictured in this. Um, we really have to take care of that. Yeah. Tell Luke. How about you, how about you do it? Because I'm going to forget. You do it in the chat. Call all me. Right, fine. I'll... I'll see what I can do. All I'll, right. Hold on. I'll look into it. And on that note. And on that, I'm sure. Thank you.